So uh, this is the distinguished lecture session. IACR uh, awards the distinguished lectures to people who made, made uh, important contributions to cryptology research. Uh, and the venue of the distinguished lecture alternates between Eurocrypt, crypto, and Asia Crypt. Uh, this year, uh, the IACR Board of Directors decided to award the distinguished lecture to Ingrid Vauboyhede from the COSIC Research Group at KU Leuven. Uh, Ingrid is a world-renowned pioneer in the field of efficient and secure design of cryptographic algorithms in the embedded context on ASICs, FPGA, and embedded software. She is an inventor of several patents in these domains and an author of two books. She received numerous awards, including the IEEE uh, CS Technical Achievement Award, two ERC advanced grants, and in 2021, she became a fellow of the IACR. Uh, please uh, welcome Ingrid. Thank you. Um, I get nervous from these kind of introductions. Um, so I will, my presentation is about hardware. You've heard that. So maybe it's a bit out of what you usually hear at this conference. Um, so, and, but I want to start um, with uh, one slide and that's basically my background um, in the sense that I don't have a background in cryptography nor in computer science, but in microelectronics and um, moved a bit to, for my PhD, to digital circuits, but my very, very first conference uh, when I was a second year PhD student was actually Eurocrypt. Uh, and yes, <laughs> it was Eurocrypt. They accepted my paper. And this is actually, I know, I don't know if this, this pointer works, but you can see this is um, a dash chip. And at that time it was two levels of metal. And you can see at the bottom, that's as eight as boxes, as you got, all know. Um, this has permutation rounding, and this has data paths of 32 bits and 48 bits, and you can see that. So this is 32 slices, this is 48 bit slices, and these are permutations. Permutations were a challenge at that time because we only had two levels of uh, metal. But I think the, the title is uh, still valid, and it says security considerations in the design and implementation of a new desk chip. And that's also what I want to do with you, is actually link security cryptography requirements to hardware design, and hopefully provide you with a um, set of new research challenges to work on, or the challenges we have now uh, to implement um, crypto um, topics and crypto algorithms, okay? So first I will start with uh, giving you kind of position, where is cryptography in the design of embedded systems? Um, uh, introduce the concept of root of trust and a bit on how, how we integrate cryptography in embedded systems. And, but I also think cryptography relies on hardware because it needs performance. See that dash chip from the previous slide not just performance, but also secure implementations. And this is a challenge. We want to, imp we want to protect all these crypto topics against side channel attacks, fault attacks, and so on. And then I go to two topics, which are a bit more circuit. I'm going to show you even transistor. Um, and that's how we can do secure key storage, which is very important in embedded context. You don't have much space there. And also something which a lot of crypto and security protocols rely on, that's how to generate random numbers. Uh, random numbers don't fall out of the air. That's, it's tough to generate them. And then maybe some challenges to work on jointly and some conclusions. So what are these next generation embedded systems that we work on? The first one I want to show you is from the context of automotive. Um, this is a picture from the newspaper, a local newspaper in Belgium. And there is a local company called Melexis, and what they build is actually sensors for cars. And these sensors do, they measure everything. They measure uh, your exhaust, they measure the, the steering wheels, they measure the wipers, they measure the tire pressures, tire pressure, and so on. The, the rain, whether rain or light sensors, and so on. Now, one Tesla car, Oops, one Tesla car has uh, 58 of their chips, only of this company. I'm not working for this company, just to give to illustrate to you. 
If you buy a high-end Mercedes EQS, you have 170 of their sensor chips. And this is not including all the chips from someone else, right? It's just them. You can imagine what a security challenge this is. Uh, if the tires give the wrong pressure or false pressure number, or if you want to know what, what's the status of your brakes, you have some issues. Huh? And um, these car networks have been attacked. And the most famous one is this uh, hackers that uh, killed uh, Jeep. This had been a financial disaster for Chrysler. They had to recall, I don't know, 1 million or 2 million cars or so. So what's the challenge here is that these devices are networked and they have a local network. So it means that they need secure, authenticated communication, low latency, not much data, uh, but it's emb embedded. Embedded means whatever solution you provide has to be compact. Those things don't have external memory or disks. It has to be cheap. There's no batch processing to speed things up. And they interact with the environment. So they have sensors and actuators. So that should be low latency, compact, cheap. And of course, they need to be resistant to attacks. That's from automotive. So, but uh, how do we evaluate security? Um, I'm not going to show the video, but um, this is uh, work we've done also at COSIC in our hardware lab. And it's quite famous. And this is only security of the key fab. So Leonard, who's PhD in our group, uh, attacked or found weaknesses in both Model X and Model S key fobs. Um, and so for the older key fobs, they had basic mistakes, like there was no mutual authentication and they use very weak crypto, 40 bits or later on 80 bits. But there's lots of improvements in the second version. And second version even uses a secure element. Still, there are problems with the protocol. So implementing these things is much more complex than just implementing secure uh, crypto. Um, and automotive is not the only one. The second example I want to show is actually the internet of things or the internet of everything or whatever you want to call it. And these days, um, we're talking about e-health, e-commerce, e-voting, smart grid, everything becomes smart, big data, and so on. Um, even the economist this month had a whole section on wearable technologies that promised to re revolutionize the healthcare. Now, I have seen some projects like that who try to do that. And this is a project which was uh, developed at IMEC, now a couple of years old. But this is how they see it. So you have the human body will have a set of sensors. And these are sensors for hearing, blood pressure, glucose monitoring, implants. They even consider brain implants. Um, these days, you probably can hack your brains. Huh? Um, but the, and this network is called the body area network. Body area network co uh, connects to your mobile phone, which is then the, your little edge server. And from there, the data goes to your medical doctor or your uh, insurance company. And the insurance company probably doesn't need the same information as the medical doctor and so on. You can imagine that this is a huge security challenge beyond uh, having some crypto there. Um, and so we can conclude that anything that starts with either E or smart these days will need uh, security. Um, um, so, but how do we start? And basically if we design or we want to add security to these things, we try to figure out what needs security, what doesn't need security. You want to minimize what needs security. And so we introduce for that the concept of trust and trust uh, boundaries. And for trust definition, I go back to the definition of Ross Anderson in his book, uh, Security in Engineering, and he has it after the NSA. So a trusted system or component is one whose failure can break the security policy. A trustworthy system or com component is one that won't fail. Basically, there's going to be somewhere a component that maybe you cannot verify and that you need to trust. And that's what we want to minimize. Trusted Computing Group has a similar definition. Uh, an entity can be trusted if it always behaves in the expected manner for the intended purpose. So loosely stated, if a trusted system or common fails, th bad things can happen and the whole thing can fall apart. So from an embedded security perspective, we really want to minimize what needs to be trusted. We want to minimize that. And, and um, 
and in this context, we want to see how does cryptography fits in there, right? What parts of cryptography we want to trust? So um, let's start with the old model, the model which applied when we were designing the dash chip. Eh? So in the old days, basically what the trust model we had is that the attack would happen on the communicating channel between communicating parties. So you had uh, somewhere a desktop and maybe somewhere a computer room, which were considered closed and secure. And so the attack would happen on the communicating channel, which means that encryption, cryptographic operations, your security protocols sit in black boxes. And the only thing we need at that moment is protection by strong mathematical algorithms and protocols. And I think this field has evolved enormously over the last than 20 years, 30 years, and there are strong mathematical algorithms, there is niche standardization efforts and so on. So from a hardware perspective, what we focus then is how can we get these algorithms efficient? Efficient meaning um, compact in area, sometimes high throughput, low energy, cooling issues, things like that. And I have some examples here over the past projects done. Huh? The first one to the left is the desk chip that I showed. The second one was our very first implementation of the Randall algorithm. It was, no, it was not yet called AES at that moment. And basically what you see, you don't see anything because this is a standard cell design. And so it had already a bit more levels of metal, so you don't see much on that one. The third one, was uh, an elliptic curve uh, processor. And that one, um, we wanted to prove that this could be integrated in a passive RFID tag. Passive RFID tag, basically you don't have battery. The only power you have is what you scavenge from the air. Um, and we want to demonstrate that this is possible because at that time they were saying, oh, public key, you cannot put it in a sensor node. It all has to be symmetric key and so on. Um, lately, Together with people at Purdue, we finished a Sabre chip. And again, you see even less uh, on these pictures. So the, the, the elliptic curve, you can still see that the data path is very regular. And the reason was that uh, it gave us some side channel protections. I mean, for details, you have to go and read. And this is the latest chip. This is a Sabre uh, chip. And so what's next? That's pure efficiency, yeah? feasibility, uh, cooling issues, energy, battery lifetime issues, and so on. And so these days, what we focus on is extremely lightweight crypto or things like fully homomorphic encryption. Can we include it in one chip or in one um, FPGA and so on? Now, the, the trust model we're using these days is the following one is actually we no longer assume that these are gray uh, black boxes, but we actually assume that crypto, cryptographic operations sit in gray boxes. So you have attacks, not only on the communicating channels, but on the devices themselves. So that's a different model. And so um, you still need these strong mathematical algorithms and protocols, but you also need secure implementations. Um, the implementations leak, uh, you have heard about side channel attacks, you can address them with fault attacks and so on. So, and that will be a bit the focus of this presentation. Uh, we need secure implementation, not only secure algorithms. The secure algorithms, I'm very confident you guys make extremely nice jobs. So uh, that problem uh, is maybe good, well done. So um, um, there have been many side channel and fault attacks. Uh, you have heard of those. There's power attacks, electromagnetic attacks, timing attacks. These days, very popular are microarchitectural side channel attacks. So cache attacks, transient execution attacks. You have heard of spectre and meltdown that can be used to attack and so on. Uh, there's many types of fault active attacks, EM, laser, clock voltage glitches, and actually you can combine any of those. The attacker is not limited to that. The attacks can be local, can be remote, can from, be from a distance, uh, and so on. Um, these are some of the equipment that we have in our lab. Some of these attacks are very cheap. A simple compact power measurement can be done with a shunt register or current probe, and you can do that for 150 euros. And you get probably frequency in the kilohertz, megahertz. And for many of these attacks, this is sufficient. Um, contactless 
power measurements, it's still power measurements, but that's with EM probes. So you don't have to open up or you get close to the power pins. That's a bit more expensive because these probes are a bit more expensive. Um, Compactless measurements um, with EM probes, EM measurements, like this kind of big bulky uh, antennas, they pick up what the chip is doing. But you can also do what's called local EM measurements. A local EM means that you go with small needles, you go to the center of the, the chip and you can have very localized measurements. Um, and that they can pick up seniors megahertz to gigahertz, but there's quite expensive uh, material. Um, so now I want to go a bit to the different research topics that I think um, more work should be done, more collaboration with hardware designers should be done. Um, and these are the five topics. Uh, two are about masking and then about randomness. And maybe at the end, some hardware challenges. So the first topic I would like to address or discuss is side channel attacks. Side channel attacks have also been discussed in this uh, conference. Uh, and one of my statements is that masking is extremely hard in practice. Um, lots of theory has been developed, but in practice it's extremely hard. Um, so I guess I don't have to explain what is masking, but masking is actually a technique to protect against side channel attacks. But what you do is you have a sensitive value, you split it in um, random shares and you operate on the shares individually. If those shares don't mingle, you actually protect uh, against um, attacks. Many types of masking have been proposed, Boolean masking, arithmetic masking, inner product masking, threshold masking, and so on. Um, but they all start from a similar leakage model. They all assume that once you share, that these shares leak independent, that they don't interact. And that's kind of hard already. And the second uh, assumption they make, they all require randomness. And sometimes they're very uh, picky about randomness. So sometimes they don't need much randomness, but randomness is expensive also. Um, and so I'm gonna show you two experiments, one on symmetric key, um, that's masking techniques for AES on microcontrollers, so embedded microcontrollers, ARM, M3, M4. And the second one, public key, about the cost of masking post-quantum. Post-quantum, basically limited here about lati on uh, lattice-based uh, encryptions. Um, so the first experiment I want to show is from Arthur and Leonard, and that's uh, side channel attacks, first order side channel attacks, on software masked AES uh, implementations. And we went through eight publications. You see them here uh, with their paper titles and when they were published and what the typical masking method was. So most of them on this list are Boolean mask and two of them are inner product masked. And they were, some of them provide provable secure masking some of them uh, use only pseudo-random numbers, generators, um, but they have even been published at uh, Eurocrypt. Now, this is our results. These results were recently published, is that six out of the eight um, were simply attacked with a first order attack, not even higher order attack. A straightforward, sing simple first order attack to six out of these uh, uh, implementations. Um, one had an incorrect random number instantiation, uh, some had benchmarking issues, some had software bugs. So it shows that it's difficult to mask in practice, right? Um, so, and we use for this no advanced attacks. It's just a straightforward statistical method. It's called correlation power analysis. All implementation, we started from the, the given code. Um, we only inserted triggers for our scope, and it's a textbook first order CPA. So we attack either S box in or output, uh, first round or last round, bit on humming weight leakage, um, and only 20,000 traces. They're all limited to 20,000 traces, where many of these implementations claim resistance for uh, into the millions or, or the billions of traces. And I don't make any claims about the mathematical concepts or proofs, that's uh, outside my uh, expertise. 
Um, and so, so this is how we do these setups. So you see a setup in the lab here. Uh, so you have the only thing you need is a PC and a scope. Um, this is a standard evaluation board for ST uh, microcontrollers and a programmer and some connections. And these are the results. Um, for those that have not seen uh, correlation power analysis, if you do attacks on AES, you actually attack byte by byte because AES is a byte uh, oriented algorithm. And um, because it's a byte by byte, it's a divide and conquer, um, you want to guess one byte out of uh, 256. And so in X axis, you see the progress of the number of samples on the Y as the correlation coefficient. And so for each of these uh, papers, either we attack first round or last round, that the correct key byte pops out uh, at some point. Oh, I can use this one. So, um, and yeah, you see for other ones, you see for either first round, if first round is well protected, then maybe last round uh, has an issue or the other way around. So if you want to see more details, uh, check the COSET paper. And I think what's important is that if you propose something, some conferences have artifacts uh, evaluation. So it would be nice that this is also done uh, in this uh, context. So what's the violation? Why do these things leak? is because the assumption is made that the shares leak independently. Now, this is mostly not the case. So we have to think about new models in this case. And for microcontrollers, it means, for instance, that you have in a register a first share, and later on, you move a second share in the same, in the same register. So what's happened there is that the, um, the information on the two shares being XOR together is leaked. Huh? But this is for simple microcontrollers. It gets much more complex if you want to do the same ex exercise for transient execution. You have no control what your processor is doing. Um, compilers might completely mess up with uh, everything you're trying to do. You might even have coupling between power and ground networks of different parts of your processor, right? And so I think also below 60 nanometers CMOS, the model doesn't hold anymore because there you start to have what's called static leakage. So you even leak uh, if you don't do any uh, calculations. So that one topic. The second topic I want to address is that um, masking is expensive. Uh, masking is expensive. Um, and I want to illustrate that with post-quantum crypto. So um, if you have lattice-based post-quantum crypto, as the NIST standardization is going on, you have this uh, concept of CAM, uh, key encapsulation mechanism, where there is like three, uh, it's public key. So you have a key generation part, an encapsulation part, and a decapsulation part. And on the encryption side, basically, the basic concept is you have something encryption that uh, we're going to encrypt. We have a public key and a random number, and this generates you a cipher text. And if on the receiving end, you basically, in, uh, you should decrypt your cipher text with the secret key, gives you the random number again. But to make it CCA secure, which this community knows what it is, um, we use, or the, these developers of this algorithm use a uh, concept of the Fuji Saki Okamoto or FO transformation. Basically, you, you re-encrypt um, re-encrypt and you actually check if this ciphertext is similar to this ciphertext. And this technique is used both in the Kyber and Sabre uh, implementation with slight uh, variations. If you would zoom in um, and zoom in and you see the, what people focus on uh, in implementation, uh, so the feasibility aspect, not yet the security aspect, then the expensive parts, so this is the uh, decryption is also the modular arithmetic. The expensive part is also the hash function and the sampling. So you see in the beginning of the competition, you see quite some papers that compare the multipliers of Sabre versus the multiplier of Kyber cost uh, functions and so on. But overall, in my opinion, they're very similar. The only difference is that Sabre works power of two, uh, while Kyber works with a, a prime number. Power of two is much nicer for hardware designers, so we really like that. And the first one uses module learning with rounding, 
uh, versus model learning with error. And rounding is also much nicer for hardware designer than this explicit uh, error additions. So this is if you focus only on feasibility or performance. Now, if you want to um, mask this again, we want to protect it. There's actually two forms of masking have been used here. One is Boolean mask. The other one is uh, arithmetic mask. Maybe that's also easy here. Boolean mask means that your sensitive value is split in Booleans, a uh, Boolean shares, which then XOR them together, get back to your sensitive mask. The arithmetic mask is the the one you share. Um, oops, I'm too fast. You sh oh, la la. What am I now? Uh, yeah. You actually um, are, do arithmetic shares and then because the algorithm uses both, you have this issue that you have to convert from Boolean to arithmetic shares and from arithmetic to Boolean shares, and that makes the whole thing really expensive. The fact that we have polynomial multipliers or, func or hash functions doesn't matter anymore. This is the expensive part if you want to do these things. So the arithmetic masking, that's easy to protect. You can simply uh, split it. Overhead factors are pretty low. So if you have a, the pointer is gone. But if you have two shares, it's a factor two. If you have three shares, it's a factor three. So that's, that's okay. That's the easy part. Um, it's a bit more expensive for Kyber because you have these explicit um, error terms here. Um, if you want to protect the hash function, you actually have to go for Boolean masking. But there you see already the cost becomes a bit bigger, right? So if you have two shares, it goes between six and 10, depends a bit how you're, you're counting or what you call, consider as your uh, base. But three shares, you have an overhead factor of 73. That's already a lot, right? So that the hardware people consider that too much, right? Um, the same happens for this centered binomial sample. That's actually a really complicated one because it uses a mix of arithmetic to Boolean and Boolean to arithmetic. It's expensive. I'm gonna, gonna go into detail because the one thing that I do want to um, focus on is the cost, say in this case, only from one, one, only one arithmetic to Boolean conversion cost. So optimized with bit slicing, uh, because uh, to amortize the cost a bit, it uh, costs 60,000 cycles of work without any useful work being done. Uh, uh, for two shares, 200 cycles for three shares, 350 cycles for four shares. And on um, purpose, we put these blocks in big on this picture because you see there is two big arithmetic to Boolean shares here. So, to, to illustrate how expensive masking is, this would be a typical table that people give and they would say, oh, I'm gonna compare cyber to Sabre to Kyber. And you see that uh, Kyber is a bit more expensive than Sabre to around the factor two, depending on the order. Um, so, but in my opinion, they have similar costs. Huh? Mask, unmasked, they're about the same, depends who's programming this. But masked uh, Kyber is a bit more expensive because of this power of two and because of the fact that we can use rounding versus this explicit error sampling. But I think the message really is the cost of masking compared to unmasked implementations. That's where the cost is sitting. So if unmask is a factor one, first order, you have a factor four to 10 overhead. Second order, you have a factor seven to 15 overhead. And third order, up to a factor 20 overhead. Plus it requires a large amount of random bytes, 12 kilobytes here, uh, 42 kilobytes here, 90 kilobytes here, only for like one execution of the, the algorithm. So masking is expensive and it requires randomness. And so that's the two topics or that, that randomness topic is the next topic I want to address. So I think from um, crypto, a viewpoint, it would be nice to come up with um, computational units, which are easy to mask, right? If that's a risk, that would be a research topic uh, to work on instead of having this mix and match and have an expensive hash and so on. So the next topic is randomness. Randomness is for many crypto security protocols, something that's kind of falling out of, uh, out of the air usually. 
and I illustrate this with this um, simple protocol. What the protocol exactly does is not important, but that's typically how crypto protocol papers look at it. And so you have somewhere a state and this was a protocol for RFID tag. This was the time when we were working on our um, low power elliptic cur curve unit. Um, and so we wanted to put that somewhere in a tag. And so we the, some proper uh, protocols were developed. So you have a tag and you have a reader and the tag uh, is a, a cheap device. And so you, on this thing, you actually see two types of randomness. You have secrets uh, because you have a secret part and a public part you're also secret part and a public part and you have randomness that's being generated by the tag or randomness being generated by the reader so we have two forms of randomness and randomness again there doesn't appear by itself right so we have uh, in hard and actually two ends of randomness the first one is, is that we want fixed randomness, which is stable over time, which you can use as a secret key, which provides you entropy for a secret key, or we have a varying randomness, which changes over time. And that's the randomness which you use for a true random number generator. Um, and on purpose, I've shown the same circuit here. This is actually an SRAM cell, an SRAM cell can, uh, part of an SRAM can be used uh, to generate physically unclonable function. And from that, you can derive a secret key. The same um, cell, but then different, different readdressed actually becomes a metastable cell. And this metastability can be used to generate true random number generators. Actually, really high quality random number generators are being uh, developed for that. Now, in this case, you have um, you want fixed randomness, and we are annoyed by the time varying randomness. It's called time varying noise because of process variations, timing, uh, environmental variations, and so on. And here, if we want a true num number generator, we want fresh randomness each time we call it, but we might sit with fixed noise because of biases in the circuit. And these are also the consequence of process variations uh, and so on. So I'm going to discuss both types of randomness a bit now and maybe give some, in, some hints on how we can work uh, together. So the fixed randomness are also called silicon physically unclonable functions. Um, and so the purpose is to have a cheap, unique ID or key uh, on your chip. And they want to use this to replace the more expensive non-volatile memory, because you have to realize that non-volatile memory in a cheap device is extra processing chips and steps and makes it more expensive. Um, also, you could use, if you don't have non-volatile memory, you don't have the process, um, you could use fuses, but fuses are big. I mean, we can, you can almost, you don't need much of a microscope to see them. Um, and you only have very few, maybe 50 to 100 fuses on a chip. And the last one, what you sometimes see is battery-backed SRAM. So we have SRAM to store the key, but there's actually a battery, a little coin battery on the outside to keep your secret. Now that's also kind of annoying. If people start to play with their battery, things are gone and so on. So we want something which is cheap um, and can be used in an embedded context. Um, um, and there can be, I mean, where we have constraints on costs and resources. Um, this variability sits in the chips. So I have two pictures here. Um, it could be because you have dopant variations. And this is a, a, a picture of a wire. And you can see this is not perfect. But so you have variations in resistance value, capacitance values, um, things like that. So um, what, during fabrications of, of chips, people try to reduce those effects. And you buy a digital chip, it's going to be reliable, always generate the same thing. But in practice, there's a lot of compensation techniques that go in to do this. And it gets uh, even worse when you scale down. Um, oops, these are the pictures. Uh, if you scale down, say Moore's law, now we are down to seven nanometers, five nanometers. So you get more processing steps, more layers of metals, new materials. Um, and decreased sizes actually increases the variabilities. And you can see for those that ever had an electronics class, this is a just a planner, uh, a planner um, transistor, and the gate drain and source. These days, 
from 60 nanometers on, you have fin fats. Fin fats kind of creates you more surface, so you have more transistor area. And these days, these are not in, in uh, production yet, I think. These are called gates all around. You see all these gates here going, and so you have more surface. Uh, but you can understand that this is going to have actually also much more process variability. Um, but to make this useful in a security or protocol context, um, these process variations are modeled by so-called puffs. And a puff is a function. We want this function to be binary. So binary means you give it an input challenge and there's going to be an output response. And these, um, the way it works, then you're going to have a set of challenge response pairs that go or correspond to your chip. We want them to be easy to uh, evaluate, of course. Um, so this is, would be an ideal picture of the more, almost ideal puff picture is that you give it a random challenge, 128 bit uh, challenge, and you would get 128 bit uh, response. Now, between two chips, two different chips, the responses should be statistically 50% difference, right? Um, and we and but the way we want this is that these responses are of course unique unpredictable. If you have a few challenge response pairs, you should not be able to predict the next one. Unclonable, it means if you kind of open up the chip or you poke with the chip, the, the challenge response pairs are gone. Uh, intrinsic, so no extra processing steps, temper-proof, stable, and so on. Um, the first message that I want to give you is that those RDF puffs don't exist. Forget about it. It doesn't exist. So in reality, you actually see two times of puffs appearing. The first one are called key puffs, sometimes also called weak puffs, but I don't like that terminology. And the second category is called authentication puffs. And authentication puffs have been developed trying to avoid crypto, but I think you need crypto to make a quality key puff, right? The key, the key generation puffs actually are an array of identically designed and identically processed uh, elements, but we're going to use the process variation, right? So this is, a, and each element generates one or a few response bits. These response bits are high quality, so you have high entropy, um, but you have a limited number. For instance, an SRAM puff, 1024 or 2000 bits SRAM might be able to generate you a 128 bit uh, key. Um, but yeah, the weak terminology, we don't like that. So don't use it anymore. Uh, besides that, there have also been proposed um, uh, authentication puffs, so-called strong puffs. The, what we do there again, we have an array of identically processed elements but we start to do operations at the circuit level. Some of delays, comparing frequencies, adding up currents, comparing voltages, things like that. So in that, this way, you can create a bigger challenge response space. And so it might have authentication purposes. The problem is that they're really low quality, that these challenge responses are highly correlated usually low entropy and mostly broken. The individual elements might have entropy, but not the way they're being combined. And the reason they were introduced is because they wanted to avoid that you have post-processing to generate like a, a secret key. Most well-known example was the Arbiter Puff, which comes out of uh, MIT, and typical application was IC authentication. But basically, that's broken. Huh? Um, so I want to show you how a weak puff is built in. So this is an example of an SRAM. Um, so these are back-to-back -back transistors with access transistors, uh, um, access transistors again. And here you see a typical readout. If this thing is balancedly processed and you power it up, uh, in SRAM, when you power it up, it doesn't know whether it should have store a zero or store a one. So it will at random either store a zero or a one for a balanced circuit. Um, if And so in this particular SRAM, powering it up, some bits where zero is black, uh, one is white, but you, if you look carefully, you see also gray dots. And the gray dots are 
or puff concept, unstable bits. So if you have multiple power-ups, sometimes they power up to zero, sometimes they power up at one. We don't them, want them for secret key. Maybe we can use them as a random number, right? And so the quality of um, puffs is being evaluated by measuring actually some statistic, the interdistance and the intradistance. Interdistance means what's the statistical difference to two identically produced puffs, but their responses. And 50% is ideal. Intradistance means what's the difference between multiple readings of the same puff. That gives you a measure of uh, stability. And so we want to avoid uh, the gray reads up. So, and these are typical examples 50% here, 12% there. Um, um, we've done some exercise at some point in, uh, in the context of a European project. And you can see microcontrollers have embedded SRAM because you use it. Uh, uh, but some of them have nicely statistic, nice statistical properties. So, this SRAM, for instance, was in a PIC microcontroller. I would not use it, or you can clearly see that it has reduced uh, entropy, and that's also visible here. Its, um, it's uh, intradistance was a bit better, but especially interdistance was uh, bad. Like this ST processor has a much better um, response, eh? so the, there's much more entropy in, in its SRAM, but it has a higher noise level, so we have to compensate for them. Uh, one of the problems here also is, is that we have to look at these microcontrollers as black boxes. So if you buy a new batch, you might have to characterize it again. And so the whole exercise has to be done again, right? Now, that brings me to, to from this path, we still don't have a key, right? Um, so cryptographic keys, um, what you want is, so you have a path. The path comes with its intradistance and interdistance characterization, which is not perfect. Then comes this, uh, this kind of black box. And out of this black box comes the perfect cryptographic key, 128 bits, immediately usable in a crypto algorithm. Now, this box, this magic box, is kind of the interface between the hardware and the crypto. But this is also difficult to make, right? So in practice, how it goes is actually that there is these constructions. Um, and so you try to measure the entropy, or you do that statistically, and um, evaluation of a bunch of, of chips. And you have the puff comes with a certain amount of uh, entropy, which is not perfect. There is uh, all these uh, variations. And so it comes with so-called helper data algorithms. If you're in the field, you know what I mean. Um, and the helper data al the algorithms will help you to stabilize. Your key will also help you to get um, um perfect under i mean perfect perfect doesn't exist but a uh, high entropy uh, key out of it so the remaining key what comes out is then the perfect one the 120 bit uh, key that you have now implementing implementing this helper data algorithms typically the solution you see is that uh, this is now we're working in the whole embedded design so um you have a puff um, the puff wants we want to use this lightweight key and then have a lightweight crypto algorithm here. The problem is between the puff and the lightweight crypto algorithm, we have two big blocks. And the first one is this helper data algorithm is to uh, correct errors, drop uh, un unreliable bits and things like that. And then typically it goes to universal or cryptographic hash, in practice, cryptographic hash function. And then you get this perfect 128-bit key. And I've drawn it small because these are now the big parts on chip. So what would be nice from this community, actually, is that you can tolerate not so perfect keys. That would be nice. If you can give me an algorithm that I can tell you, you get 256 bits, or maybe you get 512 bits of key material, but it's not perfect. What can you do with it? That would be really nice, right? That could avoid all this, I mean, avoid part of these intermediate steps. And so it's okay if that block is now a bit bigger, but it's still going to be, the overall design is going to be uh, smaller. So we need secure lightweight key generation, but can you work with key material, which is maybe not so perfect? Um, we can discuss how this should be modeled, right? Um, we know if it's 
we know the cryptographic security assuming a perfect key, but what's the cryptographic security if it's not perfect? I don't have an answer, but would be a nice topic. And that brings me last to my last topic. Um, that's the cost of true random number generators. And we basically have a bit of the same problem there. We have the same problem is that many of these protocols um, require perfect randomness, perfect unpredictability of the numbers. And also there uh, would be nice if some of it could be kind of relaxed, I would say. So I'm gonna show you some design attacks on random numbers. Huh? Um, and for random numbers, we actually can make similar pictures. The only difference is the change over time. So if you look at the architecture of a true random number generator that wants to pass uh, German or US standardization efforts, there's a big design, there's a big block. So you have the noise source, and the noise source can be your um, metastable, metastable SRAMs, can also be uh, clock jitter, uh, can, can be all kinds of effects that typically goes to some digitizer and out comes what's called the raw bits. Now the raw bits are then being algorithmic and cryptographic post-processing uh, goes through these steps to generate internal random bits, uh, which then are perfect to be used, right? Which get like the label, these are the right numbers. Uh, at the bottom, you see here a set of tests that are going on. You have randomness monitoring, you have health tests. These are extremely important. That's where we focus a lot of our research up because they operate on the raw bits. Can I, if I have a small embedded device, can I on the spot kind of detect that the, the random numbers have decreased quality? Because post-processing usually consists of some crypto algorithms. And if you do statistical tests here, they all pass, of course, right? So there are some tests there too. Um, just to show you what, what's the game that's going on, that's the game between uh, attacks and, and defenses. Um, we have a, this is the work of uh, Saki Osuka. Um, this is a ring oscillators, uh, random number generators based on ring oscillators, and we want to at attack them from a distance. So, um, um, and depending on which frequency you use, you can either influence it, and that's already visually seen here. Uh, so there is quite some correlation between those bits. There's a reduced entropy. Maybe a different frequency actually don't generate anything of uh, results. But still, you want this online little test to detect whether you're in this situation or in this situation. Um, here's the basic structure of ring oscillators. Ring oscillators, I'm, we've seen the metastability case now, this is jitter-based. So you have a bunch of free-running ring oscillators and there might be XORs together. You might use a fourth one or an independent one to sample this thing. Um, you have to let them run for a while so that there is enough jitter accumulated and then you can, um, you can um, collect your random numbers. So in a non-locked state, so you have the normal ring oscillators, they kind of all run independent. Uh, that's the signal that you pick up from the scope. And so that's the output which corresponds with it. Inject something, you see that the jitter on the signals is reduced uh, uh, if, you, if you select the right frequency. And then this is the, the, the results you get. Now visually, uh, we chose this picture because it's visually nice, but of course, in practice, you should look at the statistical properties of the numbers that come out. Um, and for that, we have all these health tests here, the health tests and post-processing. And the health tests, you actually have several options to do these health tests, right? So uh, the options you have is, so you assume you have this little sensor node, it's gonna be implanted and it needs random numbers, or um, it is some IoT device and it needs random numbers. You can run statistical tests. If you accumulate enough data, you can run statistical tests and you're gonna figure out whether um, these random numbers pass these tests. And the, the standardization processes provide you the set of tests. Um, when you want your random number generator to be standardized, you also have to provide a stochastic model. So you can also verify your stochastic model. You have jitter physical models and so on. 
But I think the only thing which will work on an embedded context is a source specific test because you want this thing to be low latency. So you don't want first to accumulate millions and millions of bits, do some tests and then release the bits. No, you should be able to do this on the fly. The second thing is that on an embedded device, you don't have a big disk to accumulate all your data. So you have to kind of make a decision and release the bits. So you have to think about the memory requirements and so on. Um, if I would have a bit more time, I would show you a little design on it. And so in, for instance, in this particular case, what you could do is you can have a simple countermeasure on chip, which would be a bias detection because you're going to have uh, bias or correlation detection. Uh, so your neighbors, that, uh, that this thing, and you don't need that many bits for it. Uh, but the attacker will also play with it. He will try to figure out um, if you have such detectors on chip, you have what's called, um, you have to avoid false, false alarms also. Where's the statistics? And you don't want the thing to go too much in false alarm. Uh, so you have to, to figure out what are the boundaries? So that means that the attacker can try to stay below the detection radar like by actually turning its wave on and off, which you see here. And so this is when the wave is on quite long. Some, and so this kind of random number still has some entropy. And so protocol should be able to use here. And here again, it would be nice that you that we have protocols or figure out, is my masking scheme still working when I don't have perfect uh, random numbers or is my protocol still okay if I know that actually from my random numbers, 75% are ones and 25% are zeros, can you work with it? Can you absorb it? So that would be nice because that makes the overall system a bit more uh, secure. Brings me to my last slide. Um, so what are the lessons? Hopefully we learned. Huh? Uh, provable secure masking does not mean secure. Theory and practice are very different. Um, practical evaluation in the lab of theoretical security, in my opinion, is a must. We have a lab, you can come. Um, pa papers should include artifacts evaluation. Other conferences do that. If you go to USNIX, you have to uh, submit your uh, artifacts. Uh, the second thing is, I think a lot of collaboration can happen on masking, especially higher order masking or other um, techniques. They are very expensive. Uh, orders of magnitude uh, would be nice to have less stringent, more realistic models, reduce the randomness requirements, maybe the amount as well as the quality. So work with less perfect keys, less perfect random requirements, and maybe trade off security versus entropy in this key of random number generators, right? So future work, I think I've been doing this now for a couple of years. I want to continue in it. From the feasibility side, so which is pushing the boundaries at this moment, um, is this implementation of fully homomorphic encryption with bootstrapping include, including and so on. We had a presentation at the FHE workshop uh, on Sunday where we showed the basilisk uh, chip in this context. I think also we should take advantage of novel compute architectures, multi-core, heterogeneous multi-core, combined CPUs, FPGAs, um, things like that. Um, a bit more side channel security by design. So you want to be resistant against all kinds of combined fault, side channel, microarchitectural attacks. But take into account new leakage models, maybe use with a bit less uh, perfect randomness. Uh, because we know if we take or turn the random number off, we can break the chip. If we turn the random number on and we have perfect randomness, the masking might work. But what's in between, right? Um, and take more advantage of these inherent variations in silicon technology. So one example I showed was uh, puffs or, or IDs, uh, random numbers, but also the variable randomness. So it's not just random number generators, but like new technologies like approximate computing. Approximate computing is this technology where you have can go extremely low power, but once in a while computations will fail. So what do you do with that, right? Crypto cannot tolerate, other applications can tolerate that. So that was my last slide. I'm open to questions. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Ingrid. Uh, we have time for questions now. That's okay. Uh, questions? Oh, Nigel. Nigel has a question. Good. So on, on your first one, you had um, all of these papers came with implementations that the authors had done, yeah? So um, can you offer a service in Leuven for people to um, submit their papers and, and you just run an attack against it? Because if obviously the people writing the papers could implement it, but they can't implement the attack because... Yeah, th you have a good point there. Um, so, um, but say, I know the some of this was done, say, in the... Um, uh so the service which was run say uh by by uh peter schwab and his people i mean people were claiming oh i'm so much faster than this so their code they could evaluate uh, code now this work this eight papers uh it was a uh, it was a couple of months work yeah and the first thing is get the code to running i mean documentation is missing but yes we we, we can uh, collaborate i think that's possible um <laughs> Uh, uh, you go, yeah, go to Usenix, you have to submit it. For, and you have to submit it for others to evaluate. Plus, Leuven should not be the only ones doing this. Eh? <laughs> oh, I'm going to charge. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, there's a question over there. Microphone. Microphone. Uh, Maybe I'll give you mine. Oh, there is one here. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very fascinating. I have a question that maybe applies to everybody in this room, hardware and algorithms. Um, uh, basically, I'd love to hear your perspective on whether we're working at the correct level or whether this is there's somehow an intrinsic sort of uh, tension between the vulnerability and the need to actually get into devices, maintain them, repair them, understand them. And that if we continue to work on this level, we'll still be sort of be ants on the surface, uh, looking at very low level versus, uh, you know, looking at the systems that we're trying to build and not yet quite understanding or never understanding what their ideal kind of specification and functionality is. Um, and, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I get your point. I think it's indeed very important. And we also try, I mean, not just for the crypto part, but for also the, the software, people don't need to know what's going on in the processor, right? But what is what is extremely important is working on models. So representing lower levels of abstraction uh, for higher levels. And in some other fields, um this has done pretty well so at high level for instance before i tape out a chip i know already i can predict how much power it's going to consume but at this moment we come with a new countermeasure we can we cannot predict anything it's a lot about models that doesn't i mean the mod and the existing models say for power consumption of a whole chip i know beforehand how much power so because i have to design beforehand i have to know how much cooling i have to provide for that chip so i can estimate it before even the first step out and in crypto that's kind of missing i mean in in security not crypto right we, we our models are way too simple thank yeah. you thank you uh, I think Ran has a question, right? Yeah. Uh, hi, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Great presentation. Um, so, uh, if you were to design your own, you know, hash function so that uh, you can implement it uh, securely without uh, 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 such an attack, would you be able to just from scratch? Don't implement the given thing. Just what would be the idea? Like we have hash functions which are snark friendly or you know pairing you know pairing you know whatever uh, 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 because of composition friendly on a high level maybe the, we can think of building a hash function that is just like a, a side channel friendly from the beginning uh that's maybe you know i'm sure you've thought about it that's it's also a new thing but uh, uh what your thoughts about it and another question actually given talk was given by rather earlier today about this uh notion of uh consumable consumable tokens or one out of two memory so there was this idea presented many years ago about one out of two memory that can do beautiful things in crypto but can be in the very even thoughts about implementing it in hardware, not just in small, not something which the whole processor 
something, but nothing actually, as far as I know, was implemented. This talk yeah, earlier today was trying to go to biology, doing something like that, but maybe we could do it yeah, in sure. silicon. Yeah. So is there any thoughts of that? Yeah. So for the first question on hash functions, um, uh, this is a bit how, how uh, Kosikin Leuven works. Then I'll go and ask Bart Prunel. Um, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. But uh, so uh, to merge you together. To yes, together. indeed. <laughs> so that's I think, um, and and I think it it will go into into. Um, in two steps. Uh, first, and this is what I'll show. First, we always go and so is this thing feasible? Can I make it compact? And then on we look at, at side channel counters. But maybe this is things do it early on in the process, right? That's uh, something like that. And the other thing, yes, I think there's uh, instead of implementing in biology, you can have basic elements. I'll have to go and check exactly what, what you wanted, yeah. but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm here. Sorry. I'm curious, um, when you have the alarms in your circuit, how often do those alarms create extra leakage of information? Very good point, indeed. Um, so the attacker has freedom. So the attacker can start playing and so start playing and say, um, what's the boundary when I can trigger an alarm, right? And so from that, you can try to deduce information. That's, that's a very good point. Um, um, this is, for instance, I mean, this is at, at crypto level. What happens if I, um, uh, and that's why these things, uh, see, uh, this FO transform, you make, want to make sure you get the, either a positive response, yes, this was a correct key or no, but you should not leak back information. And so this is, this is for all alarms the case. Um, yeah. Um, this has been used, um, not just alarms, but also performance counters. Like for instance, on big processors, you have these monitors, like how much power you're consuming. And uh, for instance, if you're consuming too much power, they will reduce the clock frequency or they reduce the power, uh, the voltage. Um, from these counters, you can also deduce information what's going on on the chip. So this, this, this is a good point. But it typically solved, um, looking at the complete picture. You, you cannot build one generic thing that's going to solve for everything. Typically in embedded context, we say this is going to be the application, this is going to be the attacker model, this is going to be what we can, can afford and what we cannot afford. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so let's thank uh, Ingrid again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have a multi-party computation session here in this room in five minutes and symmetric key uh, session in the other room also.